Hi, welcome to Crime in the Mitten. We are your hosts, I'm Shelby. And I'm Aliyah. Every week, you'll hear a new true crime story based in Michigan, from the mysterious missing cases to the gruesome murders that left the police struggling to stay on the scene. We're giving you the inside scoop on what's going on in our Mitten State. Tune in every Wednesday for your weekly dose of Michigan true crime. Because this episode is about the killings of young children, this may not be suitable for everyone. Listener and reader discretion is advised. Hey, true crime lovers, and happy New Year's. It's Shelby, and I have a story today to tell you that you won't believe happened, but it did. This is the first case of the year, so we're diving in headfirst into some serious true crime. So let's get it. Living in this crazy world, school shootings have sadly became a problem we have to face on a more frequent basis. Many remember the Virginia Tech shooting that took place April 16, 2007, where a 23-year-old student opened fire in a dorm and academic building across the street. Did I ever send you the Hi Ho Kids video? I don't think so. Okay, so I'm, you have to watch it. You have to watch Hi Ho Kids, period. Yeah. But it's a series on YouTube where they have different kids basically working on a TV, not really a TV show, a YouTube mm-hmm. show. So one of the the little segments they have is Hi Ho Meets. Right. And the kids meet people that were in different situations. So they've met a blind person. They've met a a, a UPS driver. And they also met a, um, a school shooting survivor. Right. And she was in Virginia Tech. Oh, really? Happened, and she was shot. Wow. But she was one of, she was, I think she was the only person in her class that was shot and lived. And that survived it. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. I, you got to send me a link to that too, and then we can also post the link to that yeah, I will. on um in our social media yeah. and our podcast. But one of the little girl, or she wasn't a little girl; she was maybe fifteen. And the lady asked, like, "So, does your school have like drills? What do your school do about this stuff?" She was like, um, "All they told us to do was if a shooter come into school, throw our school supplies." Wow. Yeah. So that's like their only. Way like yeah, but in, the only way of protecting yeah, themselves. It's really hard to supplies. even find ways to even like because like, it's, it's crazy that this is even something you have to consider like that we have to plan for. Like you have to be right. like have weapons that can be taken to school that in case something like this happens. That's crazy. Like I can't. Uh, I don't like school, the world what do like we that. Have to throw? Yeah, that's I have true. My laptop in a purse. <laughs> I'm not throwing my laptop now. Nah, like, <laughs> okay. But 32 people were killed and 23 injured before he turned the gun on himself. This shook the nation, but five years later, another big shooting takes place, and this time, children were the targets. We all remember the tragedy of Sandy Hook Elementary. A gunman killed 27 people, 20 of them children. The country mourned the loss of the children and administration killed in this evil act. On February 14, 2018, a gunman opened fire on the campus of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and killed 17 people. 13 were students and three were administrators. The survivors of this actually started a national campaign to push for stricter gun laws. Then there was the Santa Fe high school shooting that took place May 18, 2018, where a 17-year-old gunman who wrote about his plans to shoot up the school and then turn a gun on himself killed eight students and two administrators before actually surrendering to it, surrendering himself to authorities. And it's even more crazy because did you know that the first school massacre not only took place in Michigan on May 18th back in 1927, but still to this day is one of the worst massacres to take place. Virginia Tech had a total of 56 victims, but what if I tell you the massacre we're going to talk about today had a total of 103 victims. The massacre I'm talking about is the Bath School disaster, where a name by the name by where a man by the name of Andrew Kehoe blew up the north wing of the local school where over 300 students attended. Bath School was a school that taught grades K through 12. The point of the school being built was to put an end to scattered schoolhouses. Andrew was born on February 1st. 1872 in Tecumseh, Michigan. And I don't know if I'm saying this, like, you know, this right, Tecumseh. (laughs) So bear through it with me. Um, He was born into a family of 13. When his mom died, his dad remarried and Andrew hated his new stepmom. 
It was said that they constantly stayed into it, going back and forth. Later in his life, there was a quote-unquote malfunction with the stove, and it blew up, setting his mother, stepmother on fire. He watched for a few seconds before actually throwing water on her. That's messed up. It is. Like, they said he sat there and just, like, he just watched, like. It's, it's, they didn't know then, like, all right, he's going to be a problem. Yeah, like, like no, it kind of, you kind of, like, that's, that's a red flag. Like, why why are you, you didn't, it's not like he had a reaction to it. Um, I think his dad was at work or, like, on the farm at the time. He wasn't, it was no one around, so that's why they never were able to, like, come to an agreement on, like, what happened. And malfunctions were never figured out, so no legal actions were taken. And his stepmom actually died from her injuries a little after. Andrew's life moves on, and he attends Tecumseh High School, and later he attended Michigan State College, which we all know as Michigan State University now. After college, he moved to St. Louis and, in 1911, had a fall which caused him to be in a coma for about two months. Some said after this incident, it made him more erratic, and later on, so many tried to use this as a reason as to why he did what he did. A year later, he meets his wife, Nellie, and they buy a 185-acre farm from Nellie's aunt for $12,000. Something that kind of threw me was the fact that some of the surviving students said that Andrew was actually a pleasant man, and it was just known that he hated the school board. So he was cool. With, like They thought that he was like pretty friendly in the neighborhood, but it was just like we everyone like, openly knew he school. did not. Yeah, he didn't like the school board. Why? For many reasons. <laughs> uh, so... He didn't like the school board, but he especially didn't like the superintendent who Andrew strongly believed was the one persuading the board to vote for higher taxes. So he was upset. Yeah. So he kind of took it out on the whole board because he was like, everybody's pretty much against me. Like, I'm the only one that's fighting for lower taxes and stuff, and everybody wants to raise them. So (laughs) when the board would have to make decisions, Andrew was normally the difficult one. Voting for the opposing choice when everyone would come to an agreement on something else. He also tried to make extreme budget cuts on on necessities for the school just to be able to keep him from spending any more money. So, like, we don't really need paper towel. (laughs) Stuff like that. Yeah, no, he's like, they can, can, like, shake it dry. Like, like, he was trying to find anything in a book. They wipe their hands on their clothes anyway. Yeah. He was definitely described as a frugal man. Others would say that he was an impatient man when others didn't agree with what he wanted. He dressed pretty well and always made sure that he was neat and clean. His neighbors stated that he was pretty bad at farming, but really good at tinkering with machines, and that he actually preferred to do that instead. So he would spend all this time, like, instead of actually farming, he would be building a machine to make farming. He would be building a machine to make farming easier instead of just doing the farm, like taking that energy he's putting into... Uh, building the building yeah yeah. So you see where though. you see where his intentions were. <laughs> it was also said that he shot his neighbor's dog because it was on his farm barking, and that he also beat his own horse to death because it wasn't working efficiently. So it was definitely known that he had a mean streak to him, but people evil. never thought that he could do the heinous thing that he did. So, so did the rest of the neighborhood did they just not know about his stepmom? I don't think so. Okay. Because, you know, if it's the setting of, like... like, rack all of these things up, it's like, okay, this man has a problem. Yeah, it is. But I think... I don't... I really... It didn't say much of, like... But I'm kind of guessing, like, in the sense of, like, they um, live in, like, farms and... Like, you know, they kind of live, like, in a Mm farm-like environment. It's kind of, like, a long stretch to the neighbor, so... I don't know. A lot of stuff probably, you know, got swept under the rug. Like, and then, plus, if the dad had, like, a suspicion that he was doing something... Like, you know, that maybe my son is a little messed up in the head. I keep that to myself. <laughs> yeah, I probably wouldn't go telling the neighbors. Yeah, I'm not telling old na- no, my neighbor, uh, my ro- uh, nosy neighbor Rosie. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> you see, I was in a, t- a tongue twister. Okay. But so many people wanted answers on what can lead a person into doing such a thing. Andrew had a lot going on, and I'm definitely not trying to make any excuses for this guy. Some of the things that could have triggered Andrew, though, into doing this massacre were that local property taxes just went up to fund the building of the bath school. So that's why he always protested at the school board meetings like this needs to be lowered because mm-hmm. but it was going towards a good thing. It was like. Yeah, it was building a school. So Andrew was known that it was known that Andrew was livid about this and constantly fought them 
to have them decrease. And he also made crazy decisions to save money, like cutting back on cleaning products as well. Because schools don't need cleaning products. That's the last place that needs cleaning products. (laughs) Forget about flu season. (laughs) Insert sarcasm. It's always flu season. (laughs) It is always flu season. It's always hand, foot, and mouth season. It's always cold season. Especially it's always school. Like, it's just, yeah. That's so that like that's what I was talking about. Like he was making like drastic cuts, like trying to get these crazy decisions to go by. Like no, these people need these things. So he had also lost in an election to be the township clerk, which was a position he had held the year prior due to the death of the township clerk at the time. So once that guy died, the uh, township clerk mm-hmm. died, they asked him to step in. So he thought like, hey, I'm already in. Y'all must like me. I can, I can win an election on my own. Right. And it was kind of like, nah, dog. That ain't yeah. how it works. Nah, nah, pimping. You, <laughs> this ain't for you. <laughs> and finally, Andrew was facing foreclosure on the farm. He had a lot going on at the time. Don't get me wrong, but he just handled it so wrong. Andrew was this very skilled electrician, and the school hired him to do some wiring throughout the school. They believed that this gave him the opportunity to set up dynamite in the school basement. He did so good wiring the ba- dynamite in the basement that fire marshals and other authorities found it hard to believe that he did this all alone. Neighbors also claimed that they saw Andrew wiring the fence to his house and that he worked hard on it for at least 10 days. And that's like, that's serious dedication. Like you're that's working. Dedication. Yeah, you're working. working. this hard to destroy people. Yeah. Like, and no, this is what he was working hard on his own farm. Right. Going to work on like his own. Th- like this is, this wasn't even the school at the time. This was like, he really spent 10 days making sure that he wired this farm perfectly. There was even a record of Andrew buying dynamite back in the fall of 1926, just a, about a year before the massacre. It didn't really raise any red flags because farmers often use dynamite on their farm to get rid of things like tree stumps. So they didn't think yeah, nothing of it. Ask, but I guess that makes sense. Yeah, they didn't think nothing of it. So it was like it was like a common buy. And then I think it was they mentioned something like he used to get it like get like an army surplus of it. Like <laughs> yeah, so that's a little concerning. That that's concerning. You have. You see? <laughs> I didn't see how many. I didn't count how many trees he had on his farm, Leah, but. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. Well, I don't think that. So I think much. that. I think Why that's. Ex- they let you order that. Much? I think that's excessive. That, but you know what? That could have been like a Costco thing, like a Sam's Club back then. Like I don't know. Like but still. That yeah, that's a lot. Like that should have been monitored. After you buy that one, that one lump sum, you shouldn't be able to buy any for the rest. For a while. Yeah, no. Like they should be like, all right, like take they your picture. Cut off point. Yeah, they should. Like you, what do you need this for? But then you know, this is back in 1927, so they're not really. You know, they don't they don't have the intention. Like, you know how now when we go in, we like, oh, like that situation might be he's trying to like, we know he's up to something. They didn't think like that back then because they didn't think like anybody would do something like that. Andrew's wife, Nellie, had been in and out of the hospital dealing with tuberculosis when she returned from the hospital on May 16th. Andrew killed her by a blunt force blow to the head. Although investigators could only estimate her time of death because she had a two-day span from being released from the hospital to the explosion. He then put her into a wheelbarrow and rolled her into the back of the chicken coop. He then tied up the legs of the remaining living horses so that they couldn't escape the explosion. He also put up a sign on his fence that stated, Criminals are not born, they are made. This sign, yeah. Which So what made him that way? Yeah, because he was like that. From a child watching his mo- his stepmom on fire. Yeah, so it's like you were you well, made then? Like, did that make him? But then you know what? That kind of actually, in a sense, yeah, like I just thought about it because think about it. Yeah, that could have been like a stressor it. for him, and then like the fire with her because think about it. What he did dealt, like dealt with fire, so I don't know. It it yeah. might be something there, but I don't know if he was trying to. Who knows? This sign was one of the only remaining things on Andrew's farm. Early morning on May 18th, he blows up the farm with the rig wires. Neighbors rush to the farm to try to help, but Andrew was already in his truck and on his way to bath school to watch his plan play out. While he was driving away from the house, he stopped at three boys who were headed to the farm to help and told them they better get, they better get down to the school with a grin painted on his face. As in like, nah, this ain't it, this- Hurry up. I got something. I got plans. You like, no, like, I got something else cooking now. Like, you know, like, and that's, that's really messed up. Yeah. And the fact that he was smiling about it. 
Now, at the same time as the explosion on the farm, Andrew set up an alarm for 8.45 a.m. to detonate the dynamite at the school. When the dynamite went off, the north wing of the school blew up, where a lot of the younger kids were located. Authorities believe that due to the large amount of dynamite, that Andrew was planning on blowing up the entire school, but half didn't go off. So he, like, he was trying to wait for all the late kids to get there, too. Pretty much. 845. He 845. Had to make sure everybody was in, was in a and school and in, in, like, in a classroom or something. Like, right, like. Set up for the morning. Yeah. He, like, he had everything planned out. Yeah. So it was like, this is planned out even all the way down to the fact that, like, you know, like, okay, 845 is like, that's when, like, the struggle. Because that is, like, around the time, like, if school starts at 830. Things aren't really getting going until like eight fifty because you still have to keep that time in for like the kids that come in late or late. the kids like me, like who had to stop and get breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> like so, he really took all this into account when he did this. So, a first grade teacher recalls seeing the bodies of her students flying all over the classroom. She was in such shock over what was happening at the time she wasn't able to pull herself together until emergency responders arrived. Parts of the building flew everywhere, and that's how many bystanders were injured and killed. Kids jumped out the first floor window and ran to the fields to avoid being hit by the flying pieces coming down at them. That's terrifying. Yeah, it is. It's like a, it, that's a, as a kid too, like that's, you seeing all this stuff going on, like around you. first graders, they, they can't even run straight. So like, yeah. What are, yeah. It's terrifying. It is. It's very, and it's like, even if you are running straight, you're not guaranteed that something's going to miss you. Like things are just falling down everywhere. And like, if you look at it, I actually have a picture of first graders are still tripping and falling when they run. Oh gosh. First graders aren't even putting their shoes on. Right. For the most part, we're still working on that one. <laughs> but if you look, I have a picture of the, uh, the bath school and it's a pretty big school. Yeah, it's a big school. And then on the picture under it oh, that's terrible. is uh, the North is the picture of the school um, with the North wing blown up. And you can see how, like, the roof caved in. But so with bad. with that first explosion, the, like, everything is up in the air. Just imagine all that debris that's in the it's air. Like, air. yeah, and that's brick and, and all kinds of different things and stuff. Like, it's a lot of wood. It is. It's a lot. So she wasn't able. So she was in such a shock. The first grade teacher was in such shock over what was happening at the time that she wasn't able to pull herself together until the, emergency, uh, the responders came. Mm-hmm. And so with kids jumping out of the um building like the first floor window of a lot of people just got injured just Just by yeah by jumping alone and just the things that were just flying down at them the explosion was heard from miles away and when people heard the explosion go off in the direction of the school they left andrew's farm to assist at the school instead one bystander recalls five to six kids trapped under the roof you can only see their body parts hanging from under the rubble. So, like, their arm, yeah. their leg, a head here and there. The faces were unrecognizable due to dust, plaster, and blood covering the bits of their body visible. Cars parked on the street were on fire due to the explosion as well. Mothers cried and dropped to their knees and prayed as the chaos took place. The school lawn became a temporary morgue. The children's bodies were laid on the lawn and covered with a sheet as they were brought from the school. And parents walked by removing the sheet, trying to identify their child, which I can only imagine being those parents' worst nightmare. It was the last day of school for these kids. Parents didn't expect their children to be harmed while at school. You wouldn't think that that's a, you would think that that's the one place a child f- should feel safe. And for so many children, school is the only safe place for them. Because of how many victims, there are ambulances from as far as Lansing that came to help. But as if this wasn't enough, Leah. He arrives at the school in his pickup truck, the back filled with dynamite and metal shards. Somehow, Andrew and the superintendent get into an argument. They begin to fight over a rifle until finally Andrew fires it at the truck, causing a second explosion. You guys. He was just, it's, so was it his plan to kill himself? It was, it was said that he intentionally put that in there. And, like, he wanted to go. I think that was his way of, like, killing himself, too, because he wanted he wanted to see what right. happened at the school and then it was just like all right did what i had to do now i'm done so you guys this explosion not only killed andrew and a superintendent but also two adult bystanders this third explosion also killed an eight-year-old boy by the name of cleo clayton 
He had just survived the second explosion at the school, and he was actually was trying to get away from the scene. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he got he missed one to get struck. By yep, another. get struck by another one. So when the third um, explosion occurred, a metal shard went straight into his stomach, killing him instantly. A survivor recalls seeing Andrew's body hanging on the wire, too, just hanging there mm-hmm. dead. It took the community until six that evening to get all of the bodies out. And everyone moved with extreme caution, fearing that there would be more explosives ready to go off at any moment. Now, prior to this attack, many people noticed some strange behavior from Andrew, but many thought nothing of it. That's why if it's like, if they're being weird, you got to say something. Like, you, yeah, you I don't put nothing like past that. anybody now. So his neighbors from his neighbor from across the street, whose name was David Hart, believed that Andrew had been working on this plan for months now. He was the one who claimed to see Andrew working hard on his wi- on wiring his fences for about 10 days. He also noted that Andrew had stopped farming for months. And I don't know how he was all up in his business, but he also knew that he was falling behind in bills. How, how would he even know that? I don't know. Were there notices? He might have seen or, like, like. Or you just see like, hey, that man ain't go to haven't been to work in like in, in months. I know he's not paying bills. I don't know. But another person who said Andrew displayed some weird behavior was a first grade teacher by the name of Bernice Sterling. She had asked prior to the explosion to use Andrew's woods for a picnic for her class. Andrew responded that if she was going to have a picnic, she better do it right away, which should have raised red flags in her head instantly. Cause that's not a normal response you get when you ask someone something like that. When the smoke cleared on the farm, authorities searched the ruins and found the body of his wife charred to a crisp. Her body was so unrecognizable that police passed over her so many times before actually discovering her. Around the body were items like the safe, some paperwork, and jewelry. Authorities assumed that he must have killed his wife so that she wouldn't ruin his plans, but for some reason, I kind of felt like he was just putting it into everything. I mean, a man tied up the legs of his horses prior to the explosion. That's pretty final. When authorities looked over all the equipment on the farm, if Andrew would have sold all of that, he would have had enough to save his farm. Yeah, he was building everything to make he farming was, easier. So he could have just sure sold these inventions. Expensive. Yeah, and if he didn't tinker so much, like do what you were supposed to do. So at the school, authorities found a gasoline container fitted in a gap between the dynamite. So expansion of gas would force through the vapor and well through the tube to spark the gap. The fire uh, the fire department suspected that this was his backup plan in case the dynamite didn't work. Andrew's body was claimed by his sister, and he was buried in Clinton County Cemetery in an unmarked grave. The school board went under serious investigation for about a week before it was concluded that Andrew acted alone in this. School massacres didn't occur like this back in this time, and many people tried to find a reason to why Andrew would even do something like this. They wanted so bad to blame things on his mental health. They called him names such as insane, demented, and a madman, and that the head injury I mentioned earlier was the blame. Which he actually got that injury while he was at um at school to be an electrician. Ironic. Right. Yeah. So, but it was concluded that he was rational enough to commit the crime. I mean, the fact that he spent months planning this and setting things up is proof enough that he, that this man knew what he was doing. Most of the children killed in the disaster were buried in Pleasantville Cemetery in Bath. The time after the disaster, about 50,000 people traveled through the town just to get a glimpse at something they thought probably would never happen. The attention quickly ended due uh, ended them due to Charles Lindbergh's nonstop flight that took place not too long after this. Some say that this happened for the best, though, because the town as a whole needed to grieve. For the most part, just about each household had a child that attended Bath School because it was the first schoolhouse for grades K through 12. Like I said, about 300 students attended the school from areas around Bath as well. The school was demolished. But a new one was opened up after the governor gave a nice donation of $75,000. The school is, the school was called James Cousins Agriculture School, but it was torn down in 1975 and the commemorative park was created in its place where the focus of the park is a piece of the original school that was still remaining. One of the oldest survivors of the disaster by the name of Irene said that she stayed home that day from school because she had a sore throat. When the explosion at the school happened, she could hear it from her farm. Her and her mother jumped in their car and headed straight to the school. She had eight younger siblings who also attended school there. And just because she stayed home with a sore throat didn't mean her siblings stayed home with her. 
One of her brother's fingers was cut off in the explosion. And her sisters were some of the kids that jumped out of the first floor window to escape the explosion. So Irene was... family was just all around working that day. Yeah, like, the fact that they, like, all there were no... to escape alive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then the fact that, like, that day she didn't go to school. Right. And depending on, like, where the grades were, because, like, how it was going, like, a lot of classes from our read, a lot of classes were moved around because they were doing, like, a test on that day. So, like, you had, like, normally it would just be, like, only younger kids on that end like on the north wing but they had moved like fifth graders over there too so that they could take their tests in and stuff in that area so you had like different age ranges of yeah you had more like a variety of age ranges that day so she was also the one irene was the one who seen um andrew's body hanging on the wire after he after he killed himself so that's like something she said was just stuck in her head like forever. forever another survivor by the name of george baird went to andrew um, Andrew's house earlier to take him his tuition and he said that when he gave Andrew the money that he didn't want to make eye contact with George like he just avoided eye contact the whole time and it was like really awkward like he just like kind of took the money and closed the door on him and stuff and remind you I told you everyone like the kids at least said that this was like a pleasant man like he, he would speak nice to, to them and stuff like even Irene would say like it'd be times where like they'd be driving by he'll stop and like ask how they were doing and stuff like that so it wasn't like he was like a standoff guy towards, towards them. them yeah so george didn't go to school that day because he had such good grades that the school said he didn't need to take the test that many of the other grades were taking that day lucky because right. yeah remember they used to have something set up like that for us where like if you got all a's you didn't have to take your final or something we took those finals. Yeah. <laughs> he was out in the fields farming when he heard the explosion at the school. He jumped in his pickup truck immediately and headed to where the explosion took place. Once on the scene, George tried to help the best he could. He drove two girls with facial injuries from the explosion to the hospital. He remembers seeing unlit dynamite in the back of the police car as they removed it from the basement. George and other kids around that time grew up believing that the name Kehoe equaled evil. Till this day, this is still one of the worst school massacres to take place in the country. We lost so many lives that day because a man wanted lower property taxes or whatever reason he convinced himself to justify his actions. Okay, blow up the school if you want, but you want to leave people's lives out of it. Like, especially children. Get rid of the school while there's nobody there. Why? It, it was at 8.45 in the morning. It was the last day of school. You... Yeah, the whole summer. The whole summer. And then if he was at the school at night. Why didn't he just quit? That tr- that too. I didn't think about that. Why didn't he just quit? <laughs> like it's, you know, like if that's the definition, like you know, like no, just quit. You're right. That's just leave. Full commitment. Like he needed everything taken care of that day for what? Right. So I hate to think about how many lives would have been lost if all of the dynamite went off in that school. About one fourth of the children in the town were killed. And there were about 900 pounds of dynamite in the basement and only half of that went off yeah and only half of that went off and you see like the damage that did so we can only imagine so many scorned the fact that he did that while the children were in school and i'm right along with them it was the last day of school and if you're really going to like i can't go i keep going back to that if it was just the last day you could have waited like you didn't have to blow the school up to be honest because if property Wait. taxes were going up to build the school, don't you think after the school got blew up that they weren't going to try to rebuild another school? <laughs> like, come on. It doesn't it doesn't make sense. Like, you didn't think this through. Like, this is like a... And I can't even say, like, you know, like a, in the moment, because he spent months planning it. So I'm like, I can't figure out his thought process. But it makes my head hurt because this, just playing out, this man was really sick. Children are the and most... He had, instead of building all of these machines, he could have just... Worked the farm by hand and still had enough money to quit his job at the school. Yeah, that's that. He didn't have to. He he didn't have to be involved. And like they said, he had like if he would have sold the stuff, he would have he, he wouldn't have been in money. debt at all. Like, so it's just like I don't know. It could have been more that was going on in his head. I don't know. Like maybe he was just that fire when his when his stepmom was on fire that really messed him up or something. I don't know. But children are the most innocent beings, and you need to leave them out of your bullshit. Honestly. Hmm? Oh, okay. So now that Shelby's done with her case, we decided to try something new. So we have a book called 3,000 Questions About Me. 
Which is very difficult. It is. I don't know why she even picked this book. <laughs> you could have just Googled some questions. <laughs> <laughs> nope, I found the book. So basically what we're going to do is every week we're going to use a number generator to from 1 to 3,000 to pick out a question. And both me and Shelby have to answer the question. So, okay. yeah, so Shelby has the question. This yeah, week. I did the question this time. So my question is, in your life, well, because, like, no, if you really look at these questions, though, they were really, like, they make you really think deep, though. So I had to think, like, I had to pick a good one. I was like, I didn't want to pick a joking one or anything like that. Like, it had to be a good one. But it says, um, are you, do you, are you where you think you would be at in life? Like, is your life how you thought it would be right now? Didn't think I would have a podcast. <laughs> um, I kind of wish I was further ahead with crafting. I closed my Etsy shop, but I do want to reopen. Mm-hmm. Um, honestly, I think that's about it. So I'm pretty okay, but I definitely thought I would be more into crafting and I didn't even consider having a podcast. I don't think I considered having a podcast either. I didn't even know what a podcast was. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah um you know what honestly i don't think my my life is literally not where i thought it would be at i think i thought i'd be getting ready to go to law school getting like applying for law school soon which yeah. is crazy like me in law school i'm <laughs> like the silliest person ever can you imagine me in suits and stuff all serious <laughs> but like i didn't think i don't know and then i didn't think that i would actually be working with kids like i think like a lot of career wise I like i didn't i didn't feel like myself i was working with kids how much longer it's gonna last i don't really know yeah but. you know I, I, i'm kind of feeling tired i don't know i'm like i want to i don't think i'm gonna have That's kids stressful. of my own met some people kids i didn't potty train like 20 kids already kids. and i was like so what am i gonna do when it's time for me to potty train my own kid i'm gonna like all right go over there with your cousin or something like i'm like i don't feel like doing this like no, one parent i didn't put my like, time in one parent said you're slacking he's two and he's not potty trained yet i'm like well he's gives your child's difficult i don't know what you want me to, i've tried I, I, I don't know what i'm I supposed to do, do this like, <laughs> but I, that wise yeah but you know what i didn't think that i would have like i'd be living on my own i'm like really like i mean i knew i was like an independent person but mm-hmm. like I didn't think that like you I would move actually move in that apartment to be alone. Yeah, and so it was like now like I'm like I'm like an end of like I be I'm like I take care of like I, I can take care cat. of myself. <laughs> yeah, I have a cat. I have a boyfriend too, but you know me and my cat we was trucking it out for a couple of months. Like it was just being hurt to the world blow. Like <laughs> for like a year. Like yeah, like a solid year and a half. So I don't know that I didn't think I would have a cat. I wasn't really a cat person. I wasn't an animal person. I'm like, oh, you got a cute puppy. Like, can I pet it? And that's it. And keep it pushing. But I didn't think I would have like a cat. But no, that. And then with the podcast. So, no, I don't think that my life is where I thought it would be at when I was younger. But I'm not disappointed. No. No, I'm not really disappointed. I've been like, I take trips. Yeah, it's like I travel. I'm I'm fancy or whatever. Yeah, you take a lot of trips, though. I'm like, you, you lows, like. Shit, know me with the trips. We got to schedule a double recording for another trip. Yeah, where are you going this time? Hawaii. Oh yeah. Okay. Never mind. I know about the Hawaii trips. That's cool. Oh gosh, she's just dropping news like this on you. <laughs> <laughs> like that, like on both of us. Like I'm like, this is news to me. <laughs> I'm like, we're going on vacation again. You're not taking me this time. <laughs> I mean, you got a month to prepare, so. I just, I get, like, I don't even get souvenirs. She don't even bring me sand back. Like, what kind of friend are you? <laughs> you got a picture. We were just now, the last time I went to Hawaii, we were still only having, like, twice a year, <laughs> twice a year outings together. That is true. But still, you could have, you could have, you could have still had some sand. Like, it would have been a nice gift now if I would have got sand. you like, I've been thinking about you all these times I went on vacation, <laughs> and I was just waiting for the sand to give. Yeah, that would have been nice. <laughs> I got you. Next trip. Yeah. You know what? That question wasn't as hard as I think it would be to answer it, though. No. It was like, I think that was a pretty decent question. I, I started it off strong. <laughs> if I do say so myself. It really took... She gave me two pictures to pick these from. 
Yeah, we don't have the book yet. But so this week I just sent Shelby a couple pages out of the book and told her to pick one. And it was no, it was Next two week, pages. We're using the number generator. It was two pictures, and it took me one hour to pick <laughs> a question. There were like forty questions in total, but it was so when the she questions are so the deep. Simple question: Have you ever made your own ice cream? But she wanted to go deep into life. I never made my own ice cream, so I knew the answer to that one. I was like, I can't talk about that. <laughs> Think about it when we had to do that science experiment. It was my birthday, so I had a teacher uh, give me I, hers. I quite honestly don't remember that. Oh, we was in Miss Brown class. I don't think you had her, I had but Ms. we had Brown. to for your birthday. Uh, yeah, I was still. In we Brown made class. ice cream, and Probably I was like, I she remember. was like, "You got to make the ice cream to get an A." And I was like, "It's my birthday. Can you just give me the ice cream you made as the I example?" Switched out of her class until the time I went to Hawaii. And nobody changed my schedule for me. Y'all just let me get my class changed and didn't say anything. Oh, yeah, and then everybody woke we came in class, and it was like, where's Leah at? <laughs> Everyone was in that class, Leah. It was lit. <laughs> it was a nice time. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Crime in a Minute. You can find the transcripts, pictures we've discussed, as well as the links to our references at our website. There, you can also find the links to all of our social media. If you have a case you'd like us to talk about, you can leave a comment down below or go to the Contact Us page of the website and leave a suggestion. Each month, we will choose one for an episode. Please like, comment, and subscribe. It helps a lot.